hello friends and welcome or welcome back to the page if you're new here hi i am mia and today i'm actually going to be catching up on my 90 day new testament i was going to say bible in a year but it's not in a year it's 90 days so i have a lot of days to catch up on and i figured this was the perfect opportunity to show you guys what it looks like as far as each day of the reading as well as how i use my highlighters and things like that so we're going to take it one day at a time and i'm going to just collapse them all into this one video so ladies let's get our bibles out and let's read the bible together now we are on day 50 which is first corinthians chapters 7 8 and 9. So as you see here, I have my NLT Bible. I am doing the Streetlights NLT version, but you also see I have these two. I did write on them what I highlight. This one says fulfillment, but obviously in the New Testament, Jesus fulfills a lot of the prophecies, so fulfillment is pretty used. These colors, I don't really have them labeled because I really just write whatever with those. Oh, this one should go up here. So I kind of have them in little groups. So these are promises, any angel interactions and visions. So those are the different colors that I use that for. This one is important stuff, which as you can see is a lot. Encouragement, I also use a lot. And then these ones I actually just rewrote. Um, so I always keep these two together or really these three. I always keep together warning, wisdom, prayer, um, and then we have commands. So any commands from Jesus, God, or the disciples. Abba, I use for any mentioning of God as our Father. Jehovah Shalom, I use for any mentioning of God as a peacekeeper or how he keeps our peace. Jehovah Rapha, I use for anywhere that Jesus heals or the apostles are healing. Ruach Elohim or Elohim, I use this for any mention of the Holy Spirit. And then Yahweh, I use this one, which just means sovereign, whenever there's something where like you can clearly see God's hand in it or something about, you know, Jesus, things like that. But as you can see, this is where we're marked. Usually I use brown. If the scripture is mentioning another scripture, I'll use the brown pen. That is the only one that's kind of designated. I'll use the brown pen just to mark where in the old text it's referring to. So yeah, I'm going to listen to Streetlights now of 7, 8, and 9, and then we'll do a little recap. All right, so I highlighted this section, which speaks a lot about the commands to husbands and wives to be sexually fulfilling each other. I did these ones, which are wisdom. I feel like I probably should have did this one as a warning because it talks about how Satan will tempt you, but wisdom or warning, I feel like they're, they could be similar sometimes. But I did do here in wisdom how, I believe this is still Paul, is saying that it's better to not marry. And if you do marry, you shouldn't leave one another, which is a command. So again, blue, that's, that's one, is command. And then we have this color here is encouragement. So for a believing wife with a non-believing spouse, your marriage will bring holiness. All right, so going back to commands, each of you should continue to live in whatever situation that God has called you in. And just a reminder that we aren't slaves to our sin or circumstances, rather to God. And then I did have one that was a warning down here. If you get married, you will have problems and troubles and whatever. If you're married, you know that. And here is wisdom. If you have a wife, do not seek to end the marriage. And then again, some encouragement. If you want to be free from the concerns of this life, an unmarried man or unmarried women, basically when you're not married, your interests aren't divided. So it's a little bit different than when you are married because your concerns also include your husband, your family and things like that. And then just a little more words of wisdom. If a man decides or a woman decides not to get married, 
there's no urgency that's fine i feel like this is the chapter for single people or people that are engaged and i feel like especially at this age you like have to get married because everybody's getting married and that's the thing to do so yeah now we're gonna read chapter eight all right so we just finished chapter eight which was essentially all about eating food that's sacrificed to idols and whatnot and what i basically i highlighted a lot of it but one of the bigger things that i pulled from that is we don't lose anything if we don't eat and we don't gain anything if we do eat it, it being food that's sacrificed to idols. So what it said is that we must be careful, especially if you're a mature Christian, is that you don't allow your superior knowledge to cause a younger Christian to stumble, which essentially means if I know more about, you know, how to handle myself in public and I can be, you know, in a bar environment or something like that. But one of my friends who's a little bit of a younger Christian who's struggling with alcohol and or drugs or things like that, I shouldn't then be in the bars or inviting them to bars and things like that because they might look at me and say, well, if Mia's doing it, then it must be okay. So then I can do it too. And that would cause them to stumble. So it says, if what I eat causes another believer to sin, I will never eat meat again as long as I live. For I do not want to cause another believer to stumble. So I think that that is a really big responsibility that it's highlighting here is that we may not it may not be a sin for us to do something per se. Like it's not a sin to go to a bar, but it might cause your friend to stumble. And that's why you shouldn't do it. Not to say you can't go to bars or that you can't do specific things, but just to be cognizant of who you're with, who you're around, what you're posting, and how you're impacting those around you. All right, so you'll see here I have Deuteronomy 25.4 which is what he was quoting here when he says you must not muzzle an ox. And then I highlighted in here just some important things if you're a preacher. And then I also highlighted here he was compelled by God or the spirit rather. And then as far as some encouragement, I highlighted here where he said it's an opportunity to preach the good news without charging anyone. And then this whole section is all just some biblical wisdoms regarding who you're around and bringing people to Christ, which is, of course, our mission. And some commands here, run to win, discipline our bodies as if we were training athletes. And then just a little warning here at the end. So. If it was a normal day, that would be it for a day's work, which I think is really not that much. I feel like it is just short enough to be able to encompass it in any day, but also long enough that you're still getting something out of every day that you're reading it. I think it makes the Bible a little bit more tangible because you are able to read the entire New Testament in 90 days, which is such a short amount of time, but also to some just reading the Bible in general is so daunting. So if that is you, I would definitely encourage you to check out this Bible reading plan. I do have it tagged down below. It is a 90 day New Testament plan. I'm not actually reading it. I'm listening to the Streetlights audio edition which makes it a lot more palatable there's music it sounds cool and they also read it in the nlt version of the bible which simply stands for the new living translation and that basically just means it's a little bit more modern a little bit easier to read a little bit easier to understand and by a little bit i mean a lot bit if we're comparing it to the king james version so check that out but next, we are going to continue to day 51, which is 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 11, and 12. So in chapter 10, this chapter basically reminded us that Christ was the rock in the Old Testament, 
as well as how he's the rock in the New Testament. And this chapter also had a lot of warnings about different sins, including sexual sins and um, evil cravings, immorality, testing Christ, gambling, temptations. It does say in verse 13, though, a little bit of encouragement that God will never give us too much to handle and then it continues to say that we really can't dabble or like dip our toe in the water when it comes to Christ as far as you know having a little bit of the world a little bit of Christ and kind of trying to like teeter back and forth and then it ends with a pretty popular verse which is to do all things to the glory of god and starting off chapter 11 that we should be christ imitators so in this chapter it basically establishes the hierarchy of marriage where there is christ there's the husband there's the wife there's the kids and out of that order things get a little wacky so it continues with warnings in regards to when we gather together. Specifically here, it talks about communion and how you should really be checking yourself or examining yourself prior to going into a time of communion. And it ends this chapter with saying we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned along with the world. So chapter 12, which is the end of this day, touches on the topic of the fruits of the spirit or rather the gifts of the spirit because there are the gifts of the spirit and then there are the fruits of the spirit. Those are two different things. So this touches on the spiritual giftings and the different roles in the church and how we all have different gifts, but we're all part of one body. We can't all have the same gift because... How could you hear if we were all eyes? How could you see if we were all ears? So this ends with a little encouragement that we should all be really earnestly desiring that our gift be for the betterment of the greater good of the church and that God would reveal what our gifts are to us and that we would be used by God in a way that helps the whole church.